This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is a noon hour, folks. Ted Ralston here on January 4th, 2018, the first show of our next of this year coming up of our show, Where the Drone Leads at Think Tech Studios, downtown Honolulu, uh, momentarily transposed to uh, Waimanalo Beach uh, for the day here. And uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming on our show, a great uh, way to start the year is uh, none other than Jim Williams, uh, consultant of, of uh, vast repute in the world of uh, drones. Uh, Jim, sitting in Washington, D.C., and therefore all covered up with your winter finery and uh, the snow piling up outside. Uh, Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks. Very glad to be here. That, that's, I bet you're gladder to be here, but that's, that's cool. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I just think uh, for our show, you know, on this show, we normally have a piece of technology on the table. We talk about a particular issue, but this time we're going to talk about what the year, the last year has brought to us and what we see going ahead for this year in the world of drones, because it's certainly a really active time, a lot of changes. In fact, I heard today, as I'm sure you heard, a great sigh of relief at 1400 EST today as the world of drone people in the United States finally put down their pencils, hit the submit button for the last time on the FAA IPP uh, website for the solicitation for what is going to turn out to be a really interesting uh, opportunity here for folks to think about how drones are going to enter their own life in the local and uh, state jurisdictions, which is something that we've all been uh, thinking about but haven't really put pencil to paper, and this is now that opportunity. So here it is, the 4th of January, and we've already exhausted ourselves. Like It feels like it's the middle of uh, June already in terms of the effort put forth just since the first of the year. But Jim, welcome aboard again. And uh, from your perspective, Jim, what did you see as kind of a couple of highlights from last year that we ought to chat about as, as they set the stage for next year? Well, when you uh, asked me to be on this, I, I went and looked at you know, sort of a summary of what happened. It was a big year for 2017 was a big year for drones and ups and downs. Uh, you know, the, the down was when we didn't, we didn't get a rule for uh, flying over people as we thought. Uh, another down one was when registration uh, went away, uh, but then it came back, you know, so uh, a lot of us who believe that uh, uh, registering, registering drones is a positive safety thing. We're, we're glad to see that when Congress corrected the, uh, the issue uh, that was that was very enjoyable. Uh, I think the probably the highlight of drone operations as as a low light for the country was the response to the to the hurricane. Uh, I mean, the FAA took you know pretty much a 180 degree turn from the way they'd handle disaster response and and drone operations, which was you know don't bother us with that we're too busy. To uh, let's see how many we can get in the air to help out. And uh, the responses were just amazing, uh, what was able to be done. If we talk about that, that one event just for a minute, that's enough to set the stage for a lot of activity in 2018. How is that, how is the total result of that experiment, if you will, or that exercise uh, for real, how is that being pulled together, being distilled, being assessed, and, and the good and the bad being sorted out? And how is that informing the future, that particular six week long event? Well, the, the biggest barrier uh, previously for use of drones during, uh, post disasters was the fact that they weren't integrated into the uh, normal disaster response airborne activities. What happened in 2017 was that they were given the opportunity to be integrated in. And a lot of lessons were learned. A lot of um, state and local FEMA type organizations have written policies now about you know how they go about doing it who who helps whom uh how the they can hire people to uh, come in and and do work for the states for the local governments to uh, help assess and then also how to integrate the commercial ops because one of the big users was the big insurance companies they wanted to know what their liabilities were and help them to give people uh, compensation a lot faster than they could have otherwise. So it, it was good for the people. It was good for the governments. I mean, and and they learned a lot of lessons about how to how to make things go better next time around. So it's uh, you know, it was a really upside all around. I mean, in a, you know, in a very <laughs> sad situation. Yeah. Uh, but it was a good good thing for the drone world. 
Well, that's good. Good thing, not just for the drone world, for the people who benefited from the use of drones in that response. But so, so once again, the question comes: uh, Where would you think the center of information collection is at uh, DHS, perhaps, or maybe we should do, turn to our friends right down the street at the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center and ask the same question to them. In fact, we can do that. We can call them up and get them up here for the next week's show and talk about that in particular as it applies here in Hawaii. But, but good idea. You know, how do we how do we harvest the value out of something like that? That uh, and I'm uh, sorry to ask the question again, but I, I think that's a really important thing for us all to figure out because certainly the manufacturers, the people in the in the various uh, standards committees and things like this would have no end of value if they could get access to whatever the compiled total result is uh, from those events. Well, the only one that I'm really familiar with is what went on in Texas, because the uh, the head of the Texas test site just happens to be a classmate of mine from Georgia Tech, and we stay in touch. And he, he told me that they led the effort for the state of Texas, and the state of Texas Emergency Management Agency coordinated everything, and they, they worked with them. But they also connected directly into the regional office of uh, the federal uh, FEMA organization. There are regional offices there. There's one in Texas, and they coordinated closely with them. So DHS is is where it is coming together at the at the national level. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if Florida did the same thing, but I I would assume that they they would have, uh, given that the, and the FAA was in the middle. So the FAA collected a lot of those lessons learned when it came to airspace management and how to uh, manage the the manned aircraft and the unmanned aircraft at the same time in the same airspace to accomplish different missions. So That's pretty cool. In fact, that when you said that the FAA in the middle acting, acting as the airspace manager, that almost sounds like EAA, which is another good example of really complex air interaction. It would be cool, <laughs> I've just, just thought about this, but at EAA, generate a UAV function that requires integrating of the airspace operations at, uh, in, in Wisconsin in, the, in, the, in June. That would be a really learning, a great learning experience. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if they hadn't already done that. Um, if I remember correctly, it was either last year or the year before they actually flew a uh, uh, an unmanned aircraft in and out. Um, I don't remember exactly the details, but I th they may have already done that. They're, right. they're usually on the cutting edge doing that kind of stuff. Well, you know, it's it's I, again belaboring this issue, but it's a lot of value in it. Uh, I, I know that when we had when the hurricanes hit. Uh, certain of our agencies here in, in Hawaii that, that operate drones like the power company and such asked the question, how do we help? How can we, in, how can we take our stuff, load it in the airplane, and get over there and help these guys out? And mm -hmm. we, I put uh, uh, vectors into the people I knew, but it, it turns out we didn't really have a, a easy channel, you know, a place to call. There was no 911 number to call to say, how do I bring my drone into this game? So maybe one of the things coming out of this would be some way that we have a national registry or some means of uh, uh, putting the, the need statement forward and then having people be able to respond to it with some level of certification. That would be kind of the ultimate goal here. And we can actually mimic that at the, at the local level. That is, it doesn't have to be a national issue. It can be very much a local issue uh, as well. So, but that's that's what happened in Texas is that they have set up now in the state of Texas, coordinated by the the Texas um, version emergency management folks to do just that, where they they do have a way to coordinate the activities and they who know who's who's available and who isn't type of stuff. So it's it's happening. That's that's a good idea. Well, I, again, I will take the story right down the street to uh, the folks here at NDPTC, National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, and see if this isn't material for writing a couple of papers on that, uh, that mm -hmm. is uh, bring these things together and then apply it here in Hawaii. Anyway, that was a, a major event last year, unplanned and, and great value coming out of it. But there was a lot of planned activities also. There was the DCA out of our TCA. There was F-38 moving forward and generating yeah. standards on the technical side. Jim, what's your view of how that is all proceeding, and and uh, once again, how do we all tap into it? Well, the, the biggest technical barriers when I started working unmanned aircraft in general were detect and avoid, in other words, how to not run into other aircraft, especially manned aircraft, and how to, how to have a secure, safe and secure command and control link. So those were the big technical challenges, and we needed standards. So while I was at the FAA, I helped kick off the 
the standards body. So last year was a big year for them because they all they published the first versions of a detected avoid standard and a command and control standard. So that now companies have a, a much clearer path to obtain FAA certification for unmanned aircraft to operate unrestricted in the NAS. Uh, the FAA conducted a safety risk assessment. They put out their their portion of the of the documents needed to make those things real. So, you know, by the end of the year, we actually had a path forward for detection avoid and approving a command and control link as well. So that was a big, big step forward for the industry, the beyond visual line of sight portion of the industry. And that, what that'll now turn into is uh, the engineering activity to figure out how to execute with those standards in mind and keep the cost down, keep the reliability up and uh, keep uh, cybersecurity in the game so nobody can interfere with you. There's a, uh, this, this is actually a, a, a technical version of what we just described in the operational side through the hurricane. So we have both an operational and a technical point of view that'll take us into next year with some uh, uh, sound guidance. But uh, this will also result in uh, changes in the technology. That is, we're gonna have to do something in the, uh, in the C2 link area to uh, think about interference and think about the, uh, the topo topographical effect and urban canyon effect on multipath. There's just no end of factors that are gonna affect that communications channel that are gonna be right. important here. But those are, those are technology issues that have been, you know, worked for years and I'm confident that they're, you know, relatively uh, easy in comparison to the to the policy issues that were really holding the industry back. So yeah. I'm, I'm, confident, I'm much more confident in the engineers than I am in the bureaucrats, let's say. <laughs> well, that's the, okay, if we define the problem right, the engineers can take a crack at it and start working, working on a piece at a time. I can tell you, we certainly found here in Hawaii that the all the uh, work taking place on the in the public unlicensed channels can be heavily influenced by urban uh, RF noise in the 2.4 gigahertz band and such. All the cell phones going off and the printers and the routers and such can uh, really give you a, a RF background that is tough for the drones to penetrate and uh, unlike what you find out in the in the open field. So there's certainly uh, a lot of work to be done in establishing really resolute and, and uh, durable schemes that operate in these complex environments. And we need a, on, on, the, on the ground control indicator, we need an analog dial of some kind that gives you a, a relative uh, value of your ability to actually operate in this area. And uh, some, some kind of a alert to the, there's gotta be human factors going on here too, alert to the operator as to when there's a problem. Because these problems can, especially RFI, uh, those problems can be switched on and off. Daytime is gonna be one thing when all the businesses are up, Nighttime is different when things are shut down. So this will be a most interesting uh, uh, challenge as we move drones into the core of the urban corridor. And, right. Uh, First, so, then, then that raises up one of the other big things that cropped up last year, which is the uh, remote identification right. and uh, drones colliding with, with manned aircraft, which all sort of fits together in the general you know, airspace security kind of questions. And we had our... But we had, unfortunately, we had our first um, recorded, you know, confirmed collision between a drone and a, and a manned aircraft up in New York City. It didn't get, I, I didn't think it got that much news coverage, but the reporters I talked to seemed to think that it was. But there was a, uh, during the uh, UN, one of the UN meetings, I think it was a General Assembly meeting, there were helicopters flying all over the place, and one, a Black Hawk collided with a, um, a DJI Phantom flown from a guy who was who was outside of the, the TFR but flew into the TFR and had of course he had no idea there was a TFR and it hit the hit the rotor and was thrown into the aircraft so there were pieces of it that were left on board that's and from the motor that they found wedged in the helicopter they were able to track down the individual who was flying and um, Let's just say that it's you know it, it, it was a very bad day for him because the the NTSB report came out and identified you know that it was all his fault and he was you know all of these things you can go look up the NTSB reports out publicly and I just the, the FAA is going to fall on that poor guy like a ton of bricks it's it's a bad day but the good news is nothing really significant happened to the helicopter I mean it's a Black Hawk designed for combat of course so it was pretty pretty resilient but in Along with that, 
our friends in um, Mississippi State at the FAA Center of Excellence published data on you know what their studies show what impact would be if a drone hit a, a manned aircraft, and it wasn't you know it, it wasn't catastrophic. I mean that was the good news was that. It, yeah, the air, the air carrier would be very unhappy because they would have to be spending money to fix their aircraft, but it wasn't going to cause damage that would result in, you know, anything other than, than potentially a uh, unscheduled landing. So on that front, we learned a lot, and, um, uh, you know, we're moving forward as a result. So hopefully this year we'll see a, a remote identification and a flight over people rule come out of the FAA. Let's uh, let's pick up that thread of what we learned last year, how that's going to go forward, and, and take a forecast on what is going to happen next year after we get back from our one-minute break. Aloha kako. I am Andrea. I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there right now using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m., only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. It is still the noon hour, folks, in, uh, on Thursday in Honolulu and the uh, evening hour in Washington, D.C., where Jim Williams is standing by on our show, Where the Drone Leads, uh, where the first show of the year. And it's, it's so great to have Jim Williams on, who's been involved in the evolution of drone regulation thinking, education, promotion, and, uh, and defense for so many years, and uh, now can't quite seem to really be retired and is continuing on in retirement uh, in that same light. So. Jim, let's, let's just talk about your, your work a little bit, how that is going for you in your new self-occupied uh, role, and then talk about what, how this is all leading into the future, what we're going to see in drone activity, drone major issues coming up in 2018. Well, I refer to it as my encore career, okay, because uh, I'm not retired. I'm, I'm working pretty much full-time every day. Surprisingly, there are, there are a lot of people out there who, who need, needed my advice and help, and and I, I tell you, it's just, you know, living the dream. I, I'm working on really, really exciting, fun stuff uh, and, and helping move the industry forward at the same time and, and getting paid to do it. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I couldn't be happier. Uh, the, uh, even, even with a you know, near blizzard going on outside, it's still a good day here, here in Northern Virginia. So you are fully occupied now, but people could still get a hold of you. How do they get a hold of you if they want to take you on to help them with some particular issue? Uh, best way is via email, and, and you guys had my uh, email address up earlier, but it's uh, jim at jhwunmansolutions.com. Uh, I have a website. You can find me at jhwunmansolutions, uh, and you know either either way will we'll get me. I'm happy to, to help anybody out, and uh, um, I'm, I'm not cheap, but I'm reasonable. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, again, thinking in terms of the major events that are going to occur this year, we've already had one today, again today, July, January 4th, the fourth day of the year, and a major event occurred when everybody across the country put in their submissions on this FAA IPP proposal. We've got two, two act activities in terms of aerospace integration going on, 400 feet and below, which is the FAA IPP, and we have the NASA uh, SIO, which is 500 feet and above. We've got two yep. major activities, are, and they're marching off on the same schedule. They both end a month before the election in 2020. And right. so, and we still have UTM is still still trucking still, ahead still as well on, for right. NASA, yeah. demonstrating that concept. So this, again, this uh, 2018 is going to be an even bigger year than, than 2017. So what uh, I, th I think those, you know, the the two things you mentioned, the the IPPs, which, you know, the the test sites were a great thing, and they they achieved their goals, but. That all the test sites wanted to get into commercial operations, and so you know this is this is the next logical step. The IPP 
uh, provides the the way to help communities start doing commercial operations, you know, either states or locals, and, and it builds a partnership between the governments, the state and local governments, and those commercial entities that want to want to go to work. So we can hopefully help overcome some of the the more negative aspects of drone operations through the IPP. And I think that's sort of the subtext. If you, if you read between the lines on the both the presidential memo and, and the solicitation, you see that they're also interested about community involvement, how you're going to deal with privacy, how you're going to deal with responsibilities between the, the state, local, and federal. So it's uh, it's a good step forward. And it's going to be exciting to see who wins. I mean, it's it's going to be really big news when that when that comes down. For those who may not be quite familiar with it, let's just unwrap that just a little bit. That's a, what we're referring to here is the uh, UAS uh, integration pilot program is for the state and local or tribal jurisdictions to figure out how to start managing the total enterprise at 400 feet or 200 feet and below, your choice, and uh, uh, make sure that the local values are included and local risks of, and considerations are included in, in terms of privacy protection, all the things we're familiar with, as well as air safety, which is going to be still a mandate of the FAA, and put this into an operating system, operating structure that can be tested uh, in the local environment and, and produce value at the end. That, that's an incredible handover from what would normally be a heavily federally designed system over to a lot of local orientation. So mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the story we tell is that we've been whining and fussing all along saying, eh, FAA and all you federal guys, uh, you don't understand what takes place here at the local level. So finally, after hearing that enough, they said, okay, you guys figure it out. <laughs> be careful what you wish for, because it may come your way. So uh, now we have to execute that, and, and we have to do it on uh, public-private partnership funds, because there's no money coming from the FAA, at least on this phase. Right. So this is a, a most interesting thing. Ultimately, it's going to have to rest on the value to the commercial entities. If they see value in it and there's a return on investment, then that will be what will drive them in this in, in, to participate in this direction. But the thing that goes through my mind on this, Jim, is that uh, these interactions and these, these, uh, uh, these tests will take place, but with systems that are basically uh, currently available. So these systems won't necessarily have benefited from any of the work going on in RTCA or, or F-38 uh, ASTM at this point in time because the manufacturers haven't caught on with that yet. So we're still dealing with public uh, unlicensed network communications. We're still, in, still dealing with single string reliability. We're still dealing with uh, really um, non-certified systems. And, and uh, so it can only get better as the certification systems click in and as the, as the requirements uh, become uh, more standardized. Uh, so we can expect failure. We can expect uh, less than perfect operations because we don't have robustness and, and, and durability necessarily baked into the, the scheme today. So it, it's uh, kind of going in parallel. The figure out how to work the jurisdictional control and it, as the technology is coming up, as the regulations are moving forward, and uh, uh, it just it, you, you have to pay attention to it every minute in order to see what's actually going on. But uh, uh, it, well, the way I saw the IPP is is the FAA trying to you know I think the the teams that will win are the ones that bring together those commercial activities who want to certify an aircraft who want to use uh, certified communications set up specifically for unmanned aircraft with a community who is also looking to enable that and and deal with the underlying issues at the state and local level. So, you know, I, I see it as the FAA trying to bring those things together and, and potentially accelerate that integration and implementation of those technologies that were sort of enabled by the standards that are being enabled by the ASTM standards. So, to, to me, the whole point is to kind of bring, converge, the, not run parallel, but converge the two things. And, you know, that's a really interesting point. There's another analogy that fits here. Just as, uh, I mean, FAA has a uh, community involvement manual that's used to define how to bring new technology to the, to the awareness of the public and make it work. In the same sense, FAA has used that manual to generate this IPP program because it is the community being involved here now is the state and local and tribal jurisdictional governments. 
And so it's, uh, it is kind of like a parallel universe and a lot of going on, and you have to make sure that you're looking left and looking right as well as looking straight ahead because there's a lot of development that's going to happen in parallel. Now we switch gears to 500 feet and above, different equipment, different mentalities, and everything else. And uh, so the, the NASA uh, SIO program is going to seek to integrate all the way up to Class A airspace at 18,000 feet uh, mm -hmm. operations uh, to kind of normalize air ops uh, in, the, in the normally transited airplane areas. Uh, how do you see that coming along, Jim? Well, their objective is to do everything they can to enable certification of aircraft to fly in that space. Uh, I, I went to their, their one day meeting, as, as did you. I saw you there. listened yeah. intently. And they, you know, I think they're really, the, the subtext is we, we want to enable certified aircraft operations however we can. We're going to share all our research. We're going to help make airspace available for testing. You know, we're going to match make between companies and, and uh, uh, operators. And, you know, so everything they can do with the power of NASA behind them, they're trying to do to help accelerate that certified aircraft. Because that's really the, the last barrier remaining from routine beyond visual line of sight operation is a certified aircraft. So NASA's trying to do what they can with their limited funds to, to help enable that. And, and I thought it was just a, you know, a, a great program with a great plan, and I hope a lot of folks in the industry will participate. You know, I was struck by the, by the quality of the people and the speakers who were present at that meeting that you and I both attended, two days worth. It was, uh, uh, the people were, were not just giving a pitch they'd given before. This, this, this material was, was fresh and new. There's like 150 pages worth of the best collection of material that covers all aspects of, uh, of UAS uh, regulatory-oriented development. And I thought that's a good library of reference material. But uh, also the idea of uh, uh, NASA kind of saying, hey, we're NASA, but we need your help. Uh, just like in the IPP, FAA saying we're FAA, but we need your help. So we got two really cool vectors going on this year that are going to look at, at uh, how this all works. And um, so uh, once again, Jim, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, plan to get you on at mid-year when you can, you can, don't have to wear a jacket and a coat. You can wear a, a, an Aloha shirt or a Hawaiian shirt. Or Aloha shirt. shirt. Yeah, Gross. and uh, we'll, we'll take, take a tab halfway through the year on how things are moving. But at this point, I want to thank you very much for taking the afternoon hour for us uh, out of your time in DC and hope people get a hold of you from your website when they have uh, needs for hiring a, a top gun uh, guy who can come in and work on uh, UAS programs for them. And we'll all, uh, I'm sure, see each other uh, as, the, as the FAA program and the NASA program unfold in the future. Yep, yep, it's gonna be a great year. All right, you sure will. It's starting out on a bang already. Okay, thanks very much, yes, Jim, yes. for being on the show. And folks, we'll see you next Thursday.